All right, folks, gather around. Let's talk about American elections. It's a wild ride, let me tell you. Now, we usually size up our candidates based on their policies, right? Healthcare, taxes, the whole shebang. It's all about those meticulously crafted plans for the future. We're talking spreadsheets, graphs, and enough data to make your head spin. It's enough to make a policy wonk weak in the knees, isn't it? But here's the thing. American elections haven't always been about the issues. Sure, those are important, but sometimes things have gotten a little weird. And by weird, I mean downright bizarre. We're talking about the kind of stuff that makes you question humanity's sanity. Imagine a time when the shape of your skull could make or break your political career. Or when a candidate's astrological sign was a major talking point. Yeah, you heard that right. American elections have a history that's as unpredictable as a squirrel on a sugar rush. So buckle up, Buttercup, because we're about to take a trip down memory lane. We're diving headfirst into the wild, wacky, and sometimes downright unbelievable history of American elections. Let's rewind to 1884, a time when the world was a very different place and the United States was gearing up for one of its most peculiar presidential elections. Grover Cleveland, a man who looked like he could eat a whole watermelon in one sitting, was running for president. He was a hefty fellow with a stern look, but he had a reputation for being honest and straightforward. His opponent, James G. Blaine, a fellow with a face that could launch a thousand ships. Just kidding, he looked like a regular dude. Blaine was known for his charisma and political savvy, making him a formidable contender. Now, you might think the big issue was tariffs or foreign policy, but no, my friends. The election hinged on something far more... bizarre. It wasn't about the economy, civil rights, or even the scandals that often plague political campaigns. We're talking about phrenology. Yes, phrenology. The so-called science of reading the bumps on your head to determine your character and abilities. Now, for those of you who haven't spent their weekends brushing up on obscure 19th century pseudosciences, phrenology was the belief that you could determine someone's personality and intelligence by feeling the bumps on their skull. It was a popular belief at the time, despite its lack of scientific basis. Yes, you heard that right. People actually thought the shape of your head determined your destiny. Imagine going to a job interview and having someone measure your skull to see if you're fit for the position. It's enough to make you want to bang your head against a wall, isn't it? The absurdity of it all is almost comical, yet it was taken quite seriously back then. So how did this play out in the election? How did phrenology become a deciding factor in who would lead the nation? Well, some bright spark decided to compare the skull shapes of Cleveland and Blaine. They thought that by analyzing the bumps and contours of their heads, they could predict who would be the better president. The verdict? Cleveland's skull apparently indicated a lack of morality and a tendency towards impulsiveness. This so-called analysis suggested that he might not be the most trustworthy leader. Blaine, on the other hand, was deemed to have a skull full of intellectual power and moral integrity. According to the phrenologists, he was the ideal candidate, brimming with wisdom and ethical fortitude. Who knew a little bump on the head could be so revealing, right? It's fascinating to think that such a pseudoscience could influence public opinion and potentially sway an election. In the end, Cleveland won the election, proving that perhaps the bumps on one's head aren't the best indicators of presidential capability. But this quirky chapter in history reminds us of the strange and often amusing ways people have tried to make sense of the world. So next time you hear about a bizarre political tactic, just remember, it could be worse. At least no one's measuring skulls anymore, or are they? These days, candidates try to win us over with snazzy websites, social media campaigns, and those terrifyingly personalized political ads. You know the ones, they follow you around the internet like a lost puppy. Every click, every scroll, there's a new ad trying to sway your vote. But back in the day, things were a little more low-tech. Campaigns relied on tangible items and face-to-face -face interactions to get their message across. We're talking about a time when a candidate's biggest campaign expense was probably kerosene. Yes, kerosene to light up the night and draw attention. See, before there were television debates and Twitter wars, there were torchlight parades. These parades were grand spectacles designed to rally support and show strength. Imagine thousands of people marching through the streets at night carrying lanterns and torches emblazoned with their candidate's name. The flickering lights created a mesmerizing and powerful visual. It was like a rave, but with more flammable materials and less techno music. 
The atmosphere was electric, filled with chants and cheers. And then there were the cigars. These weren't just any cigars, they were campaign cigars, specially made to promote a candidate. Ah yes, the ubiquitous campaign cigar, a symbol of camaraderie and goodwill. Back in the day, a politician was nothing without a pocket full of stogies to hand out to potential voters. It was a gesture that said, I'm one of you. It was the political equivalent of a free t-shirt or a bumper sticker. Just like today, people loved getting free stuff, and cigars were a prized possession. Now, you might be thinking, cigars? Really? That's about as appealing as a wet sock. But back then, it was a different story. But trust me, in the 19th century, a good cigar was like currency. It was a luxury item that conveyed status and sophistication. It was a way for candidates to connect with the common man, to show that they were just regular guys who enjoyed a good smoke. Sharing a cigar was a moment of bonding, a way to break the ice and start a conversation. Campaign swag has come a long way since then, from lanterns and cigars to buttons, posters, and now digital ads, the goal remains the same, to win hearts and minds. While the methods have evolved, the essence of campaigning hasn't changed. It's all about making a connection, whether through a screen or a shared smoke. So next time you see a political ad online or get a piece of campaign swag, remember the lanterns and cigars that started it all. The tools may be different, but the game remains the same. Section 4. Nixon's Smoking Strategy Speaking of cigars, let's talk about Richard Nixon. Nixon, a man who would later become the 37th President of the United States, had a rather interesting campaign strategy involving cigars. Now, Nixon wasn't exactly known for his sense of humor. He was often seen as a serious, stern figure, especially during his political career. The man was about as jolly as a tax audit. His demeanor was often compared to the somber and meticulous nature of an IRS agent, but even he knew the power of a good cigar. Cigars have long been associated with power, prestige, and influence. Legend has it that during the 1960 election, Nixon's campaign ordered thousands of cigars with his name printed on them. These cigars were meant to be a unique and memorable way to promote his candidacy. The idea was to hand them out at rallies and events as a way to drum up support. Makes sense, right? After all, who wouldn't want a free cigar with their candidate's name on it? Well, there was just one small problem, a tiny detail that could have easily been overlooked but had significant implications. The cigars arrived with a slight misprint, a printing error that turned a clever campaign strategy into a potential embarrassment. Instead of reading Nixon for president, they said Nixon for president. Yes, you read that right. They printed president twice. Yes, you read that right. They printed president twice. It was a glaring error that could have easily derailed the campaign's promotional efforts. It's the kind of mistake that makes you want to scream into the void, a blunder that could have caused significant embarrassment and ridicule. Now, most politicians would have been mortified. They would have scrambled to fix the error, fearing the potential backlash and negative publicity. They would have recalled the cigars, burned them in a giant bonfire, and pretended the whole thing never happened. But not Nixon. He saw an opportunity in the mistake. Nope, he embraced the misprint. Instead of hiding from the error, he decided to own it and turn it to his advantage. He turned it into a joke. He used humor to diffuse the situation and connect with his audience in a way that was unexpected. He started handing out the cigars at rallies, saying, I guess they really want me to be president. And you know what? This self-deprecating humor resonated with people. It worked. People loved it. They ate it up. The mistake turned into a memorable moment that humanized Nixon and made him more relatable. It was a rare moment of levity from a man who was usually about as spontaneous as a tax return. This incident showed a different side of Nixon, one that was willing to laugh at himself and roll with the punches. In the end, Nixon's ability to turn a potential disaster into a positive moment demonstrated his resilience and adaptability. It was a small but significant part of his campaign strategy that left a lasting impression. So the next time you think of Richard Nixon, remember the cigars. They were more than just campaign merchandise. They were a testament to his ability to turn a mistake into a memorable and effective strategy. Section 5. When the stars aligned or didn't, astrology on the ballot. Hold on to your hats, folks, because we're about to enter the twilight zone. Back in 1869, the race for the White House took a turn for the celestial. We're talking about astrology, people. You see, Ulysses S. Grant, the Civil War hero, was running for president. 
and his opponents, in their infinite wisdom, decided to use his astrological sign against him. Grant, you see, was a Taurus, and according to the astrologers of the day, this meant he was stubborn, inflexible, and prone to fits of rage. Basically, the last person you'd want with their finger on the nuclear button. Now you might be thinking, come on, this is ridiculous. Nobody actually believes in astrology, do they? Well, back then, astrology was taken surprisingly seriously. People actually consulted astrologers for everything from business decisions to marriage proposals. So, did Grant's astrological sign hurt his chances of winning the election? Probably not. He won by a landslide. But it just goes to show that in American politics, nothing is off limits. Section 6. The Unstoppable Eugene Debs. Five times a candidate, once from prison. Now let's talk about a man who was ahead of his time, Eugene V. Debs. This guy was a socialist, a union leader, and a five-time presidential candidate. That's right, folks, five times. This guy was like the energizer bunny of American politics. Debs was a passionate advocate for the working class, and he wasn't afraid to speak truth to power. He railed against income inequality, corporate greed, and the excesses of capitalism. He was like Bernie Sanders, but with a handlebar mustache. But Debs wasn't just a talker. He was a doer. He organized strikes, led protests, and was even thrown in jail for his beliefs. But even prison couldn't stop him from running for president. In 1920, while serving a 10-year sentence for violating the Espionage Act, Debs ran for president from his prison cell. And you know what? He got nearly a million votes. That's right, folks. A million people thought a guy in prison would make a great president. Now, I'm not saying Debs would have been a good president, but you gotta admire his tenacity. The man was a political force of nature.